Trade and Business Commission, a cross-party, cross-industry group set up last year to scrutinise post-Brexit trade deals and, of course, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement itself. I'm Naomi Smith, I'm the Chief Exec of Best for Britain, and I'm delighted to be joined by our panellists today, Hilary Benn, MP and co-convener of the UK Trade and Business Commission. Hi. Neil Richmond, TD for Dublin Rathdown. Hi. And David Gork, former Lord Chancellor and Justice Secretary. Hello. Thank you all for watching. Uh, we've got a lot to get through this morning. Since the early uh, May elections, we've had a series of briefings from government, UK government, that it intends to unilaterally override parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol. We've had a partial climb down since, with the Prime Minister using his op-ed in the Belfast Telegraph to say he wanted to, quote, make it work. And today we're expecting Foreign Secretary Liz Truss to deliver a statement in the Commons. Hillary. For viewers that aren't following all of this quite so closely as us uh, political trade nerds, what are we expecting to hear from the Secretary of State today? Well, I expect, given all the briefing that there has been, that she will say, we want this sorted out, but the EU needs to move further. And if they don't, then the government will, at some point, table, introduce and pass legislation which would deal with the problems that they've identified. And it's really important to remember that at the moment there's a standoff because of these so-called grace periods. When the protocol came into effect, both the EU and the UK agreed, hey, we better give people time to get adjusted to the new arrangements. And uh, the government then extended those grace periods, not with the agreement of the EU. The EU started legal action against the UK, uh, but has stayed that while they try and sort this out. In the end, this is a practical problem. And I to take an example, if a Marks and Spencer sandwich, I've just been listening to the chief executive of Marks and Spencer on the radio, if a Marks and Spencer sandwich uh, goes into Northern Ireland or an Asda sandwich or a Sainsbury sandwich to a store there, does it require a lot mm. of paperwork? Now, I have to say, I am not persuaded that it does. And Maris Sefcovic, the commissioner, has shown leadership. He sorted out the medicines problem by changing EU law. And I said to him on Thursday, when he was at the first meeting of the UK-EU Parliamentary Partnership Assembly, thanks for doing that. But if you can do that for medicines, then surely you can move on other things. And I don't want the government to, to threaten to disapply an international agreement because that is unlawful, that's wrong. It adds to distrust between Boris Johnson and the Commission. But there's a practical problem that is staring us all in the face and it does need to be sorted out. But, Neil, the DUP are already saying, well, we can't trust Boris Johnson on this. Uh, we can't restore power sharing until we actually see the legislation. So what is all of this going to mean for restoring power sharing at Stormont? Yeah, I think we have to remember with the DUP that whatever is done announced today, it, it won't be enough for them. Um, the DUP are absolutists. Throughout this six, per six year period, they said no to every possible solution, despite being some of the hardest Brexiteers in the campaign if you actually look at their seven tests the only thought the only thing that would resolve those seven tests is for the uk to rejoin the eu sounds great to me but i know it's not feasible um so and also the dup definitely campaigned for the uk to leave the eu they did indeed and despite the warnings of that impact it would have on this island they completely dismissed it and pumped quite a bit of money into the campaign but i suppose when we're looking at the, there's two things happening parallel here. There's the standoff at Stormont in the failure to fail an executive. And then there is the practical issues of the protocol. But unfortunately, where they're overlapping, one thing doesn't solve the same two problems. Um, and something that will save the solve the practical difficulties that Hillary speaks of doesn't necessarily mean the DUP will go for that, because it's all so much more than the, about so much more than the practicalities for them. It's about identity. It's about the sense that they're somehow different uh, to Great Britain. And there is also the political narrative that the DUP aren't the biggest party after the election. By right, the people of Northern Ireland are entitled to a nationalist first minister, even though the two offices have the same powers. 
Um, and that has all played into it. So they've really painted themselves into an extremely narrow corner. And if the EU and the UK negotiators can get a resolution, that does by no means means the DUP will be happy about it. David, the constituencies that Johnson needs to try and keep happy in all of this are manifold. We've heard business groups and business leaders uh, caution him very strongly against ramping up the rhetoric against the EU for fear of a trade war. But what's the mood amongst the Conservative backbenchers? I mean, could if legislation is brought, and as Hillary said, we don't know uh, if and when that will happen, but could Johnson face a sizable rebellion over this, do you think? Yeah, I think there, there would be a rebellion in the Commons. Um, I suppose the previous experience of the internal market bill, uh, where the Commons rebellion somewhat fizzled out, isn't all that um, encouraging from those of us who are concerned about a breach of international law. But it could be different this time um, for a couple of reasons. I think, first of all, the overall climate is, is, is political climate is different uh, and that Conservative MPs may be more willing to be critical of the Prime Minister than was the case the last time we went round this process. Uh, and secondly, I think perhaps the, the uh, rebels might may be better organised, having uh, previously, I think, folded really quite quickly. Uh, and then a number were somewhat surprised when Theresa May took a very strong position on this. Uh, now, Theresa has already set out her concerns about uh, unilaterally trying to override uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol, mm -hmm. uh, and that may well rally support. Whether the numbers are there to, to, to prevent a, a, a bill going through is, a, is another matter. The big concern, I think, has to be the House of Lords. And I, I, I yeah, that. I was going to say that the, the much more sort of famously pro-European Conservatives in the House of Lords, could, could they be a problem for him as well? Yeah, and it's not just the pro-European um, members, Conservative House of Lords uh, members as well. Uh, you know, I, I, I've spoken to, uh, you know, Brexiteer Lords uh, and Conservative Lords who were very uncomfortable about this because of the, the, the rule of law issues. Uh, so I think there would be a sizable Conservative rebellion. And remember, the Conservatives, of course, don't have a majority in the House of Lords either. But I think you know, add to that a lot of, and, and, and some Conservative peers who just find themselves busy on the relevant day, uh, they won't want to defend this. So, so it's hard to see how this gets through the, the House of Lords. Um, and, and therefore, we're talking about using the Parliament Act, and that delays it all for a year and so on. Uh, and, and that's why I think that's one of the the problems with the government strategy, if that's the right word for it, that that if it's relying on domestic legislation, mm. you know, it, it, everybody knows it's 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 really going to struggle to get that domestic legislation through. Now, Neil, you're not Northern Irish politician, but you are steeped in Irish and European politics. What's your answer to Hillary when he says, "Come on, what is the real risk of a sandwich?" you know, in a supermarket in Derry, somehow ending up in Donegal? What, what's the real problem there from the EU's perspective? I suppose it's not necessarily about the sandwich. Um, it's about maybe the large shipment of meat that's come over from Great Britain, uh, possibly after an Australian trade deal that could easily get into the food and supply chain. Um, that's where it really comes down to. And it's the principle that this is the European single market. Northern Ireland has been granted full access um, to the European single market, the world's largest economic bloc, in relation to maintaining the rules thereof. Now, this whole process of the implementation of the protocol, there is scope actually within it to allow two teams of officials, not politicians, experts, to continue work that I would have thought actually was going quite well after, to be honest, Lord Frost was swapped out for Liz Truss, to go through line by line, well, actually, let's talk about what are the items that genuinely pose a risk uh, to the European single market. They might impose it today, but depending on, on the policies of the current government, that could change quite a bit with new trade deals rather than a constantly you know this is where kind of the politics has come in and ruined the process and the politics not just of westminster but also of northern ireland and um, and the risks are you know theoretical but it's very hard to go through the practical risks when every so often the agreement that governs how we resolve this situation is being threatened for political means 
by um by one half the of the negotiating period and and, and hillier is right you know the european commission legislated in relation to medicines um after the autumn but the package proposed by mara shefkovich in september october after engagement with northern irish business leaders that was fairly far reaching and it really hasn't been appreciated or accepted by certainly the british government this british government of the work that went into to get eu member states to sign off on that to get european institutions like all the kind of conventions of how the eu works um have been broken because of northern ireland and for for blooming good reason um, and i think that hasn't been taken into account at all through this process can i just take you back ever so quickly you mm. used an example of australian meat for listeners that may not be so familiar with the trade deal that the UK is signing with the Australian government. What is it in particular about Australian meat that would be of concern to the EU? Is it uh, animal welfare standards? Is it food hygiene standards? It's also impact on climate change and how they actually actually raise their, their meat, particularly cattle and sheep. Um, we would argue that food standards in Australia are considerably lower than both the UK and the EU because food standards are essentially the same still at the moment. And it's why the EU haven't finalised a trade deal with Australia. Uh, they're at a different point simply because we haven't got sign off that we're happy with um, the levels of production, animal mm. welfare and um, sanitation and everything else. And the prospect of Australian meat, uh, and not to pick on Australian meat, but it's the easiest, most tangible example, coming into the European single market food chain is a huge worry um, to the very many food providers across the EU, bearing in mind that Ireland uh, is one of the largest uh, per capita uh, providers and producers of uh, beef and lamb and everything that goes with that as well. Thank you. You. Hillary, um, the UK Trade and Business Commission has been taking evidence over a year now from businesses across the UK. Um, often the thing that they tell you is we need certainty. The thing we need more than anything else is to know what the rules are going to be, what are we going to have to adhere to? What are the regulatory standards? Where's the divergence happening? We just need to know. And you led um, a, a session of the UK Trade Business Commission to Northern Ireland just a couple of months ago. With all of this instability that now looks set to rumble on and on and on, because as you said, we don't think legislation is going to be coming forward soon. Uh, there is going to be a longer period of time for the EU and the UK to negotiate over all of this. What is the impact on disinvestment or lost opportunity cost, particularly in Northern Ireland, but presumably for GB2 while all of this rumbles on? And that's a really important question. I mean, overall, the, the attitude of business in Northern Ireland is quite positive towards the protocol for the reason that Neil just outlined. Northern Ireland can sell into the European and the UK single markets. And if business is persuaded the protocol is here to stay, what a great opportunity for Northern Ireland, what a great place to invest. At the same time, um, nobody's certain about what's going to happen. And just picking up the point that, that Neil made about the revised proposals that Maros Sefcovic tabled, they were certainly better than a full application of the rules is the rules, which has been the starting point of the commission. But we have to be honest and recognize that it would create more problems than we have at the moment because of the standoff. And it's important to remember this, more checks will mean more cost, will mean higher prices at a time when food prices are rising anyway because of the war in Ukraine. And people in Northern Ireland have the least disposable income of any part of the United Kingdom. So as well as the issues of identity, which Neil referred to earlier, and he's right about that, whether one uh, you know, agrees with the, uh, the DUP or not, um, there is a political problem. There is no functioning government in Northern Ireland. There is no functioning assembly. And for all everyone who invested so much in bringing about and supporting the Good Friday Agreement, that is a, not a situation that we can accept. And I, I agree completely with Neil that this is a line by line negotiation that should be taking place because I have this image of, of products just passing on a conveyor belt and the two sides saying, no problem, no problem, no problem, no problem. And if you could address it in that way, you could identify the ones where there is a real 
concern because remember Northern Ireland is in this unique position and the Northern Ireland protocol is also unique. It didn't say the rules is the rules and will be applied in Northern Ireland as they would to any import into the EU from any other third country. We will have a bespoke arrangement which identifies which uh, goods are at risk of coming into the Republic and which aren't. <coughs> Excuse me. So the EU has already accepted that it's not a full application of the rules. And frankly, the argument at the moment is about whether the way in which the EU wants to apply the rules to certain products, be it seed potatoes or parcels that people send to their aunties in, in Derry uh, or um, supermarket deliveries we've been talking about, there must be a way of solving this because this is not something to go to war with. And all of us who say to the government, do not breach an international agreement because it merely adds to distrust, doesn't do Britain's reputation in the world any good. We sign agreements and then we say we're not going to apply them. But equally, come on, uh, the EU needs to recognise you've moved some way. My view is very clear. You need to move further in order to solve this so we can get on with many, many important things. And Neil is right. Will it be enough if there is a solution for the DUP to return? I don't know. But since this is the obstacle that they are citing, we should work might and main to remove it. David, without wanting to uh, go back in time too much, would we be in this situation if we'd gone with Theresa May's Brexit deal? No, no. And I do, I mean, I do have huge sympathy for Theresa, who recognised um, that there is this, you know, the Irish trilemma and that, you know, if you're going to diverge, you're going to have to have a border somewhere. And nobody wants a border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Uh, and she fashioned a solution to, to, to that. It may not have been perfect, um, but we don't live in a perfect world. Uh, and that essentially addressed you know, most of the concerns here in terms of a border in the Irish, in the Irish Sea. And um, to now sort of see the, the very people who voted down her deal and then agreed to a border in the Irish Sea um, complain about how outrageous it is that there are checks on goods going from Great Britain to Northern Ireland is one that I think quite a few of us who are in the May government and others uh, feel exasperated about. Um, we are where we are. Um, uh, and, you know, I, 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 I think there are legitimate concerns from the EU in terms of protecting the integrity of the single market. And there was a deal that was signed. I think Hillary is right that if there are practical solutions to be addressed. But, you know, part of the problem, I think, is just that lack of trust in the UK government, because there's been no point where you know, this government has been both honest about the contents of the Northern Ireland Protocol and supportive of the Northern Ireland Protocol. There have been times when they were supportive when the Prime Minister was denying that there were checks. And then the point where he accepts that there are checks, um, he withdraws his support. Uh, and, and I think that just does undermine uh, trust uh, within the European Union. And that is, a, that is a big problem. And I think the government is making it worse by then saying we're now going to unilaterally legislate. Although it's interesting, you know, today they're not coming forward with the legislation. At one point that looked as if that was going to be what ha what's happening. Now it's, now it's a threat that the legislation will be brought forward later in the summer. So, David, you have to work more closely with the DUP than the Johnson government does because uh, Theresa May's uh, um, result in the 2017 general election uh, needed a confidence and supply arrangement with the DUP. You've all three of you agreed that there are practical ways to do this and that it needs to be line by line. But Neil did say, but come on, it's still not going to be enough for the DUP. Do you agree with that or do you think that they can be convinced if some kind of practical line by line arrangement is drawn up that they could be uh, cajoled back into power sharing with Sinn Féin? I think the honest answer is I don't know for sure what the DUP um, would accept. Uh, and certainly some of the rhetoric is sort of purist. You know, we can't we can't agree to anything. Well, you know, I'm, I'm afraid 
um, the only answer to that is 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 much closer alignment. And, and you know, personally, I'd have no problems with SPS alignment. I think that's where we ought to where we ought to get to, in all honesty, uh, partly to to reduce these these burdens. Um, but look, I mean, you know, wh whether we can satisfy the DUP or or not fully, um, th th there is a point about you know. If we're going to have checks from from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, we should at least try to minimise them. Um, but but I think the the method of trying to minimise them by you know threatening unilateral action and a breach of international law just undermines trust. And I think we're more likely to make progress if there is a trusting relationship rather than the sense that the UK government is trying to pull a fast one. Now, of course, trusted relationships are not confined to those between Brussels and Westminster and Westminster and Belfast and Belfast and Dublin. Neil, of course, they are also vitally important for any country around the world that wants to do any kind of a deal, trade deal or otherwise, uh, with another. A congressional delegation led by Democrat uh, Representative Richie Neal is in London, Dublin and Belfast this week, emphasising the US's bipartisan opposition to checks on the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. What do all of these threats and sort of continued uh, messages that the UK will unilaterally walk away from a, an agreement it signed mean for the chances of Johnson being able to sign that that fabled UK US trade deal, do you think? It's definitely putting it back. And the US administration have been quite clear that if unilateral action happens, if uh, the government, uh, the British government walks away from the protocol, then there's no chance of a trade deal. And that came from both Democrats and Republicans. We, we heard it from Mick Mulvaney, Donald Trump's previous chief of staff, who was the last Northern Irish envoy. He was quite blunt about that a number of times. And, and, and broadcast television and is still writing about it. Um, Richie Neal obviously chairs the Ways and Means Committee, which is where a trade deal goes through in Congress. Congress decides trade deals. The Democrats still have a majority there. And then, look, we don't need to talk about President Joe Biden's thoughts on this. He's been fairly, fairly blunt. Um, and I think if what we think back to, it's not just the US, but we all remember the, the fabled G7 meeting in Cornwall when this was a big day for, for Boris Johnson, a big day for his time as prime minister. And he went and got a lecture basically from the American president, all the European leaders, uh, the prime minister of Canada, and even the prime minister of Japan. So that's the most powerful countries in the world who are your key partners, all unhappy about this pivot in, in terms of a preparation to break international law. And um, so you would have thought the lesson would have been learned by now, but it doesn't seem to have been. Hilary, is uh, Britain's reputation sullied globally as a consequence of all of this? Yeah, because if if you're going to sign deals and then say we want to change part of them unilaterally, it doesn't, as, as David and Neil have said, doesn't generate a lot of confidence. And it's quite striking that in the last few days, the government has been at pains to say we're not talking about the scrapping of the protocol. Boris Johnson, in his interview, yesterday when he was in Northern Ireland, say there's a, you know, a lot of good things in it. And I think that is a reflection of precisely the kind of pressure that has been put upon him. But um, the other thing to remember is that we still have the grace periods, albeit unilaterally extended by the United Kingdom. Now, in one way, you could deal with this by saying, well, let's just carry on with the standoff. Uh, the government extends the grace periods, not in line with the protocol. The EU started the legal action, but isn't going to pursue it. It's how you get the negotiators to engage in the process that all three of us today have identified is required to go through the products line by line and decide where there is or is not a practical risk to the integrity of the single market in Ireland and beyond. Because on divergence, and I think that's the that is the problem that's coming on the horizon. Uh, there's an example that is with us uh, at the moment. I'd never heard of it till we went on our visit to Northern Ireland. Titanium dioxide, which sounds very unappetizing, but is a whitener that is put in ice cream and cakes. Now it's allowed in the UK. The EU, uh, I think, is in the process of banning it. 
So the question is, should cakes with titanium dioxide in them be allowed to be sold in supermarkets in Northern Ireland uh, or not? And the supermarkets, when you talk to them, are very clear. Look, we can't run two separate product lines for GB and Northern Ireland. We're trying to give value to our customers. We're trying to keep prices low, especially when food inflation is going up through the roof. Uh, can we not have this? And I'd love there to be a veterinary agreement. By and large, our standards are exactly the same as they were when we were members of the EU and haven't diverged. The political problem is the EU says we want dynamic alignment. In other words, any change the EU makes in future to food standards, whether the UK government agrees with it or not, uh, you have to apply it uh, across the whole of the United Kingdom or this idea of equivalence. And this has run like a thread between the UK and the EU during the whole of the Brexit negotiations. Um, is there a way of doing it where you say, well, you may do it in a slightly different way, but broadly the health and safety outcomes are the same. And Theresa May, in fairness, right at the beginning did point out, um, despite having, in my view, made the error of saying we are definitely leaving the single market and the customs union without quite having thought through what that would mean, she did point out that there would be a cost to the UK from divergence. And there's no point in having divergence for the sake of it. Uh, you should diverge if there's a really, really, really good reason. But the more you do diverge, the greater the difficulties this will create in the operation of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And diverging for trade deals that only boost GDP by 0.1 of a percent may... That's absolutely right. And Look, the, a trade deal with America is a long way away because of the problem we're discussing this morning. Never mind when they get into the details of well, which of our agricultural products are you going to allow to come into the United Kingdom? Health. Um, health, uh, welfare standards and so on. Because without the UK basically giving way on that, there will be no trade deal with the United States of America because Congress will never agree to it. David, we've touched on this topic, but not really got into the meat of it yet. It is the buzz phrase of the year, the one that will almost certainly headline the general election, whenever that may be, six months, two years. That's cost of living. Um, we've seen overnight the governor of the Bank of England talk about apocalyptic food price rises in the UK. So I've got two questions for you and, and Neil and David, feel free to chip in on this. If, and this is all you know, hypotheticals at the moment, if the UK follows through on its threats and unilaterally walks away from parts of the protocol, and if the EU responds with what is dubbed a trade war and imposes tariffs on goods from the UK into the single market, which industries in the UK are going to be most affected and what's the impact going to be on the already dire cost of living crisis that, that British people are suffering? Well, I think, for, first of all, the, the, you know, if we get there, and, and you're right to, to caveat it, uh, Naomi, because uh, you know, the, the, there's, there's a lot that has to happen before we get there. But, but if we get there, um, then, yeah, the, the the impact if they if they go big on this in terms of you know, tariffs and quotas uh, or, on UK goods um, could be very significant across the board. The aggregate effects, you know, can, could could knock um, GDP significantly. It's not just the direct impacts, but also the uncertainty that has created the damage to consumer confidence. I mean, didn't Nissan say quite famously a couple of years ago? I mean. What is time anymore? Post-Brexit time goes, and I never remember whether something was last year or three years ago. Um, but didn't Nissan say if, uh, you know, for as long as there is tariff-free trade on automotive between the UK and the EU, it's fine for us to be here. But in the event that it isn't, it wouldn't be viable for Nissan to stay. Yeah, they did. And, and, and look, you know, things like automotives are clearly a vulnerable sector. Um, it's also the case, look, the, the EU can, can kind of, you know, were they so minded? Were we in this rather desperate situation? Kind of pick and choose, and they can they 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 could choose sectors uh, that maybe are particularly politically sensitive. So you know, there's mm. been talk about you know targeting some Scottish uh, industries in particular, Scotch whisky, for example, um, which you know could 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 
could be seen as uh, you know, trying to undermine the, the, the union. You know, they, could, they, could, they could do quite painful things um, where the impact is asymmetric, uh, where, where, where we feel the pain more. Um, now, let's hope we don't get down that route. But I think the uncertainty that hangs over the UK economy as a whole, I mean, Hillary uh, and Neil, I think, have made the point about you know, the, the benefits of the protocol for Northern Ireland, if there's confidence in it. Um, but, but this point about confidence, I think, is, is quite important. And you know, if you're a multinational business, considering where you're going to locate, and you may feel that Brexit has, has already you know, knocked a bit of confidence, but at least you've got the TCA, at least you've got tariff-free, quota-free access to the EU. The thought that you know, the government might pursue a course of action ultimately results in, in, in that being lost um, is, is something that, that could be troubling, could be worrying, and, and could make an impact on investment decisions. So I think it's, you know, I, I suspect it's a fair way off. I don't su suggest that that's going to manifest itself immediately. But if we go further down this route, yes, I think it does worry me what the, what the sort of business response would be. And in the end, as you say, you know, rightly bring us back to the sort of cost of living. Um, you know, the, the, if we end up in a more protectionist world with um, you know, uh, tit for tat arrangements um, uh, and so on, you know, in the end, it's ordinary people who will pay the price. Neil, Britain really ought to be trying to trade its way out of a cost of living crisis. What's happening in Ireland? Are you facing similar pressures, though not quite as great because you're not dealing with Brexit quite as directly as the rest of us? Oh, for sure, the co the cost of um, living crisis is affecting all of us. Um, our trade figures would be different than the UK. We've had record exports in the first two first quarter of twenty twenty two, and our GDP growth is second highest in the EU this year. Will be highest next year, and coming from a strong base, so it's not like Portugal are highest this year because it'll come from a very low base. And um, we're pretty much on full employment. Um, Picked up after the pandemic, obviously key areas. We we make ventilators, so we turned out we sold quite a lot of them over the last couple of years, um, things like that. But the very real cost of living, it's it's in the areas that we don't have control, but we rely on open markets. So it's energy. Um, we import vast majority of our fuel from the UK um, and other places. Our, our energy and our electricity costs are going up through the roof for homes and businesses across the country. And there's only so much can be done in that. And there's only so much we can produce through renewables. And um, the second area, which isn't specifically a cost of living one, but it's having a huge impact is on housing provision, which is something that's been a huge issue here for since the financial crash, when essentially we stopped building houses for 10 years and we've been playing catch up ever since. And the cost of building a home has gone up so much in terms of getting raw materials from outside the EU, the supply chain difficulty, you know, ships floating in port outside Shanghai for the last three or four weeks because of lockdown measures domestically. They're all having an impact that less houses are being built, therefore rents have skyrocketed, they've gone up 15%, uh, mortgages have gone up. So those aren't anything that you know, our trading figures are going to do in terms of our exports. Our exports are still going up, but we're about to hit a situation where we'll have full employment, but we won't actually have people to work in the excess jobs in very lucrative six-figure salary jobs um, because we can't get them here to live in the homes. Um, and it's trying to get people to, despite being a very proud Dubliner who represents a Dublin constituency, it's trying to make sure that people move outside of Dublin too. But I don't think that's that different in the UK either. Um, no, it isn't. Hillary, the difference surely is that, that the UK is dealing with everything Neil's just outlined, though perhaps to a slightly lesser extent uh, in terms of energy dependence, but is also dealing with Brexit on top. That is absolutely right. And uh, the problem is, I mean, the government doesn't want to recognise that there are difficulties with the Brexit deal, the TCA they negotiated. So when HMRC produced figures about two and a half, three weeks ago, that showed that the number of British businesses exporting to the European Union had fallen by one third, one third, comparing, I think it was the last year before COVID hit with 2021. 
I mean, it is an extraordinary figure. And we know, Naomi, because of the evidence that we've taken on the commission, a lot of those are small businesses who were making a living. It was as easy to send goods to Paris or uh, um, Rome as it was to Leeds or Glasgow. And they looked at the paperwork and the red tape and the rising transport costs. We were in Dover yesterday and we heard about the rising transport costs for, for getting goods in and out of the UK. And they just said, well, we can't do this anymore. Um, and that is a terrible self-inflicted wound on the British but, economy but, because I, I, small I, businesses are the, are the lifeblood. Absolutely. As I understand it, the UK is becoming less trade intensive as a yeah. percentage of its GDP than most of the G7, I think, falling at twice the rate. That's correct. And the uh, Office for Budget Responsibility also has made it clear they, there's a 4% hit to, to GDP. And they also identify there's going to be a, a fall in the extent to which we trade with the European Union. And I mean, that is, that's the TCA for you, that the first trade deal in history where one party went in and negotiated a worse deal than it had already. But that is a consequent of Brexit. But it does make it more difficult mm -hmm. at a time when, you know, people are trying to get cost out of the system. You've added cost. And every time I hear the prime minister say, well, I want to get rid of red tape. And I think of the bucket load, the lorry load of red tape that he has put on British businesses. Um, I, I roll my eyes and shake my head. Well, thank you all very much. We're going to go to a couple of questions now that we've had from our brilliant viewers. Graham from Staffordshire asks, isn't the government playing whack-a-mole? If they amend the protocol to make the DUP happy, they'll just upset GB business even more. Who wants to take that one? I Well, I don't think that well, I don't think that solving the problem uh, is going to adversely affect GB business unless the government solves the problem by trying unilaterally to amend the operation of the protocol, in the which case the retaliation. Is, yeah, the, the yeah. question that you, you put to David, uh, if there is retaliation and businesses will, will say, well, you know, why are we facing tariffs? And the, the, the car industry is in a very as you identified, sensitive position, because we sell just under 2,000 cars a day to the European Union, and a 10% tariff on top of the current selling price would be really, really bad for them. So the, the business would definitely not thank the government for some form of trade war being invoked. And for heaven's sake, we have a real war taking place in Europe, a real war. Why would we want to have a trade war between two parties that are actually cooperating on the big questions that face the world, peace and security in Europe, climate change, the movement of people around the globe. This is what we should be talking to our European friends and neighbours about and not arguing about the risk of a sandwich in a supermarket in Derry. Now, the next question is from Wendy uh, in Exeter, and I think this is a perfect one for both uh, Neil and David. So I'll go to Neil first. Wendy asks, will Brexit inevitably lead to a united Ireland and an independent Scotland? Neil, do you want to talk about the likelihood of a border poll given the recent election results in Northern Ireland? Yeah, the, the recent election results in Northern Ireland probably don't change anything. Uh, Nationalists actually went down a little bit, for a bit of a bit of a percent. Uh, the unionist vote has been declining steadily. Um, the real the real news of the Northern Irish elections, and it doesn't get half as much coverage, is the huge swing in support for the Alliance Party. They nearly doubled their seats. They've shown there's a massive uh, pro-European other right in the middle, and uh, they have been commonsensical throughout the last number of years, be it Naomi Long uh, or Stephen Farry, who's now in Westminster, their first MP. Who sits on the UK Trade and Business Commission, Stephen There Farrell. you go, there's a handy plug, of course, with, with my close pal, Claire Hanna, lest I was being... Uh, also does. Uh, yeah. um, feel. To be honest, so the results of last week don't necessarily heighten it, but Brexit, it's my fundamental belief, and I say this as uh, a constitutional Irish nationalist who aspires for Irish unity within the EU, I fundamentally believe that Brexit means we will be having the most talk, much talked about border poll a lot sooner. Um, I also, quite frankly, don't trust this British government. And I don't know if we could face a, a moment where the Secretary of State of Northern Ireland on a whim calls a border poll. 
um, because you know the, the line from the Prime Minister yesterday that well we have to look at the majority party, the majority tradition. There is no majority in Northern Ireland at the moment. It's not unionist, nationalist, other. It's split. Um, so we can't. There's no placating. But I, I do fundamentally believe that Brexit and the very nature of the harder Brexit is bringing us closer to a border pole, and that brings huge responsibilities of those of us in the south who aspire to that to play a proactive role and not make a border pole or a possibility of united ireland be solely defined by the, the politics of Sinn fein which i don't think would lead to a, a better united ireland david is boris johnson nicola sturgeon's best asset uh yeah quite possibly i mean it, it's is is a border pole inevitable here i'm slightly reminded of a conversation i remember having with an irish historian many years ago who said the thing about irish history is that the the inevitable never happens and the impossible often does so I think we have to be sort of slightly cautious, but I tend to agree with 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 Neil. If what we see over the years ahead is is, is particularly you know, the Republic of Ireland as a member of the European Union being seen to flourish as a consequence of that, then the sort of new generation of Northern Irish voters who no longer want to be put into a sectarian box mm. and, and will consider these issues kind of on their merits and, and you know, what, what, what is their best future uh, and what are their children's best future, then, then I think that will shift in favour of, uh, of, of a border pole and, and a move towards the United Ireland. Um, I, I regret that, but I think that, that there's a strong possibility on that. I think on Scotland, it, Scotland is a different issue. Uh, and, and I think the sort of inevitability that if, you know, if, if Ireland goes in one direction, Scotland will ultimately follow. I, I don't don't particularly buy that logic. I think there are different issues um, with Scotland. I do think Boris Johnson is clearly unpopular in Scotland and now is helping the SNP. Um, but but uh, my sense just at the moment is the momentum behind Scottish independence uh, has, has slightly diminished. And, uh, you know, I, I very much hope so, yeah. Well, that is all we've got time for today. Thank you to everybody who tuned in uh, for this UK Trade and Business Commission live panel. And a big thank you to our guests, Neil Richmond. Thank you. Hilary Ben. Thanks, it's been great. And David Gork. Thank you. To find out more about our work, make sure that you are following the UK Trade and Business Commission on Twitter. And to find out more about all the evidence that Hillary and his colleagues have been taking from businesses across the country uh, over the last year, visit tradeandbusiness.uk. Thank you very much. And we will see you again very soon.